everybody here tonight. The series is driving home a point that if you haven't caught on, we need to be conscious that we're in a conflict. We're caught up in the conflict that began in the Garden of Eden between Satan and God, and we're in the middle. And a lot of people can say, well, I think I'll sit this one out, or I'll be a conscientious objector, or I'll just let this pass by. But the scriptures say, you're either with me or you're against me. Okay, We have to pick a side. And when we pick the Lord's side, you know you're going to get attacked by Satan. And God knows you're going to get attacked by Satan. So what does he tell you to do? Be prepared. Know you're going into the conflict and be prepared for the conflict that lies ahead. So we've had some really good speakers uh, speak on the different subjects that help us be prepared. And one of our special speakers is tonight. I don't have any idea how I'm related to him, but he is Suzanne's father-in-law. So y'all go figure this out, okay? All right, you heard Jacob, his number one son and only son, uh, speak the first of, of, of June. It had started our series, and we're glad to have Danny Hawk here tonight. He is... He received his undergraduate and his master's degree in ministry from ACU, and he served the Lord's church in a number of different facets. Many of you might remember the Northside Church. That was his first congregation. And didn't he marry one of the elders' wives there? Okay. And he's still married to her. Okay. Uh, Karen Hawk is with us tonight as well. So if you like him, you'll really like her, okay, because you haven't seen the better half yet. Okay. And then over the years, he's not only been a pulpit preacher, but he's been an interim preacher. The Tarletons uh, met him when he was an interim preacher at their church in Katy a few years back. So they're here with us tonight. He's, he's been an interim preacher in Tyler from time to time. And right now he's in where? Mangum, Oklahoma. Now, if you ever find yourself in Mangum, Oklahoma, you're lost or you're going through, okay? But if you're there on a Sunday, stop and you'll hear a good preacher there in Mangum, Oklahoma. So nothing else needs to be said. Danny, it's all yours. Okay. Well, I've had a lot of different introductions through the years. But I think the best one is that I am Suzanne's father-in-law. That's, I can't say anything any better than that. And I, I'm very thrilled about that. Karen and I are, and we're excited about it. I would clear up one thing. I married one of the elder's daughters. I think, <laughs> <coughs> had it been the other way, you probably would have heard of me. But it was not one of the elder's wives, but one of the elder's daughters. Chip is exactly right. We are engaged in a battle, and it's not one we want to be in. It's not one we have chosen to be in, but it's one that from the beginning of time we've been in. It's not new. It's not unique to the New Testament all the way through the Old Testament. God's people have had to deal with Satan and with sin. That's what happened in the very, very beginning in that garden paradise when Eve gave way to Satan. And the way Satan did it was he lied. He always lies. The Bible calls him the prince of liars. He came to Eve, and you know the story. He said, what about this tree, this beautiful tree here in the middle of the garden, the one, uh, the knowledge of good and evil? How come you're not eating that? And she said, God has told us not to eat of it. Stay away from it. Leave it alone. Said, if we ever eat of this tree, then we're going to die. And what did Satan do? He said, you shall not die. That was a lie. That was a lie. And he has majored in lies throughout the years, and he continues to do that. And that's why Paul, as he's closing out his letter to the Ephesian brethren, he says, which is the theme for this Wednesday night series, 
comes down to the end. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. I'm sure this has been read to you three or four times already. But put on the full armor of God. Why, Paul? So you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. And he describes it. And each week, you've heard a different part of the armor described. Tonight, Paul talks about the shield of, of faith. Guard yourself with the shield of faith because there's going to be all kinds of flaming arrows. You're going to need to extinguish them, put them out. Where are they coming from? The evil one. The evil one, that's Satan. Now, I thought about this tonight, and I decided, I don't know if it's a good decision or a bad decision, I'm not going to spend a lot of time about the armor. I'm guessing you've heard quite a bit about it by this time. Maybe everybody decided not to do that, but I'm going to go on that uh, premise that you've probably had some very accurate and picturesque descriptions of what the armor was and who wore the armor and how they would gird themselves with it. I want to talk just about faith. Faith. What is faith? We, we find faith and the concept of faith, the reality of faith. It runs like a, a deer throughout the entire Bible. Paul who writes this letter to the Ephesians. Paul, who writes more of the New Testament books, letters, than anybody else, he talks a whole lot about faith. And the faith that Paul talks about is not a one-time thing. It's not just believing, so hearing something and believing it uh, one time and walking away and and not spending a lot of time thinking about it or holding on to it. The faith that Paul describes is a faith that he says here can extinguish the flaming arrows coming towards us, protect us from that. But it's a faith that sustains us through everything that life throws at us. It's what he writes about in the last book that he writes, 2 Timothy, when Paul's just about to lay down the pen of inspiration for the last time, he pens those last words in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He says, the time of my departure is at hand. I'm going to be poured out like an offering, he said. But he spends a little time thinking back over his life and he exhorts and encourages Timothy, he's writing to, and all of us who are recipients of that letter. And he looks back on his life and he says, I, I have finished the race. I fought the fight. Both of those, by the way, it dawned on me a few years ago. I've read that passage many, many times, but I realized how much effort that took. Paul didn't pick a couple of things that were easy. Running a race takes a lot of energy. Fighting a fight takes a lot of courage and a lot of stamina. A lot of people start races and they don't finish them. A lot of people start a fight and they run off and they don't finish it. He said, I finished, I ran the race, I finished it. I fought the fight, I finished it. He says, I had the course, I finished that. And then he says the same way, same sentence. He says, I kept the faith. That was the important thing he was trying to get to. That was it. I kept the faith of the three things he's saying. A fellow told me many years ago when I first got into the ministry, he said, somebody comes to you for counseling, which is a dangerous thing to come to a preacher for counseling because, you know, we're good at a lot of things and we do our best at that, but 
I used to tell people I don't give guarantees or green stamps with my counseling now. I'll just give you the best advice I can give you. But this gentleman told me, he said, when you're dealing with people that come to you with problems, a lot of times they'll come in and they'll say, I got three things that are bothering me. He said, you can write it down. Number one and number two are window dressing usually. Number three is what they're really struggling with, but they just need a little bit of icebreaker for the conversation to get comfortable. So he said, you can just zip right on through number one and right on through number two and get to number three because that's what's bothering them. Now, I'm not saying that Paul didn't care about the fight and the race, but number three is what he's talking about. I kept the faith. I kept it. I didn't lose it. I didn't turn loose of it. I didn't give up on it. And he said, for that reason, henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Scripture talks about two crowns throughout the Bible. Two crowns. One of them is what is reserved for God, for Jesus, King of kings. The other one is the victor's crown. That's what you get when you run the race. It's what you get when you fight the fight, if you win. It's the crown of victory, and that's what he's talking about here. He says, henceforth there is laid up for me the victor's crown, the crown of righteousness, not just for me, but for all who have longed for his appearing. That's those who have kept the faith. So what is this faith? What is it? You ask people, what is faith? And folks will say, well, faith is easy. That's easy. Okay, what is it? Tell me. What is it? Well, everybody knows what faith is. Good. Tell me. What is faith? One of the questions that's asked very, very often in the religious world is, do you believe that we are saved by faith. Now, if I ask that question, I'm going to tell you, you're going to get different answers from different people. You always will. It's always one open for discussion. Some would say, when you say, do you believe we're saved by faith? They would say, absolutely. No question. Yes, we are saved by faith, and that's all we're saved by. My question to that fellow would be, what do you mean by that? What do you mean? What's the second question, the follow-up question? Somebody else would say, well, no, I'm a little apprehensive about that. I don't think we are saved just by faith. I think it takes some other things to go along with it. My question to this gentleman would be, what do you mean by that? Can you defend that? What are you saying? I want to suggest to us tonight that we take a real deep dive, sort of. Uh, I, we can't do a, a terribly deep dive in the time we've got tonight because there's so much in Scripture about faith. And I will try to watch that clock. I always do my best to do that. And I've been warned, don't go past 8 o'clock. The teachers won't like that back here with the kids. And I don't blame them. I wouldn't either. So we'll, we'll have you out, Lord willing, by 8 o'clock. I'm kind of like the fellow. I started to tell this at Jacob and Suzanne's wedding, but I was working the clock, and I had too much to deal with already. But I love the story. The couple came to the preacher to get married, and they said uh, the groom told the preacher, he said, I want a short service. I want a short service. Ceremony. And the preacher said, well, I don't usually go very long. I'm usually pretty brief. Young man looked at him and said, I didn't say a thing about brief. I said short. I want a short service. And to tell you and to show you what I'm talking about, he said, I've got a $100 bill here with me. And said, that's your pay for performing this wedding, which I've never gotten my paycheck from that one the other day. I don't know if it's good. It's in the mail, Okay. <clears throat> you hear the rest of the story, you'll know why there's no paycheck, probably. But he said, that's your pay as you begin. But said, for every word you speak, it comes down a dollar. He said, well, I can do that. So 
He lined them up. He looked first at the young lady and said, take him. She said, well, yes. He looked at the groom and said, take her. He said, yes. He said, took. That would be $95. <laughs> so it comes down to a dollar a word. That's probably why I didn't get a paycheck because I had a lot to say that night. And maybe I owe somebody some money back on that. But we don't have time to do a complete, thorough study on faith. But I want to look at one particular verse. It's the verse that we usually run to. Maybe we don't, but the world runs to. When we talk about faith, it's John 3.16, the golden text of the Bible. You may even see if you used to, I don't see it so much anymore, but if you look at an NFL ball game or a Major League Baseball game out in the outfield or in the end zone, you might see a banner. It says John 3.16. Everybody, if they have any knowledge of the Bible at all, know this scripture. Well, what's going on here in John 3? Just before we get to John 3.16, Jesus is having a conversation with Nicodemus. You'll remember this story. Nicodemus was a very important man in the religious world of Jesus' day. He was a member of the Sanhedrin Council. That was the Supreme Court. He was the equivalent of one of our Supreme Court justices. And he came to Jesus... John says, by night. Now, a lot's been said about that, and I don't have time to go into it right now, but I would say that probably that would indicate he didn't want a lot of people to know that he had come to Jesus. At this point in Jesus' ministry, he wasn't very popular among the religious group, Nicodemus's peers, but he comes to Jesus for a religious discussion of sorts. And in that discussion, Jesus tells Nicodemus, he said, unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said, born again? What, you mean I have to go back into my mother's womb? And she has to give birth a second time to me? And Jesus said, no, Nicodemus, you're totally confused. You don't understand. I'm not talking about a physical birth. But I'm talking about a birth of spirit and of water. Well, this baffles Nicodemus' mind. And it's this conversation that Jesus is concluding when he says these words. He says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so whoever believeth, here we go, faith, should not perish but have eternal life. Now, let's very quickly break this down. God so loved. Motivation of God here is love. It's not sternness. It's not moral sterility. It's not in any sense of the word a foreboding kind of motivation. God didn't say, I'm going to require something of my people because this is just going to really make them mad, going to really frustrate them. They're going to be miserable trying to keep the law. Instead, Jesus says, God so loved. Loved. And the intensity was so strong that he uses that adverb, so, to help us understand it better. God didn't just love. He so loved. A mother, a father, we can say to our children, I love you. But when you say, I love you so much. I so love you. That gives a, a dimension. That adds a, a, an intensity to it that we might not have stumbled on before. That's what Jesus says of God. God so loved that he gave his only begotten son. He felt compelled by the circumstances, by the need to the world, sin. He felt the need to give Jesus. And that's why this is such a beautiful verse. But it says God so loved that he gave. You know, the Apostle Paul in his writings to the Corinthians, 
He said we ought to give cheerfully. We ought to, to, to be a cheerful giver because God loves a cheerful giver. Well, you think maybe the reason God loves a cheerful giver, cheerful giver is that's the kind of giver he is? He is a cheerful giver. Jesus said he so loved the world. It wasn't just the good part of the world. It wasn't just the obedient people, the lovely folks. He gave to the unloved and the unlovely. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. You know, it'd be a great thing. Jesus says it's a wonderful thing for a man to lay down his life for his friends. He says when he does it for his enemies, that really describes someone who cares. But that's laying down your own life. That's tough. What about laying down your child's life? What about laying down your only child's life? That's what Jesus says happened. He so loved that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth on him. Whosoever. You see that? God's not selective. It's for everybody. God's calling is whosoever will. Let him come. Kind of like the old story. The young soldier was on the battlefield and... He, they were pinned down there in the, in the ditch, and the bullets were flying by, and his sergeant should, could tell he was pretty anxious. And he said, son, said, don't worry about those bullets. Unless they have your name, a bullet has your name on it, you're going to be okay. Don't worry about those other bullets. And the young man looked at him and said, sir, I'm not worried about the bullets got my name on it. He said, I'm worried about all these bullets that say to whom it may concern. <laughs> he said, those are the ones that's got my attention. Well, God, he said, to whom it may concern. Anybody, anywhere, anytime, whosoever believeth, he shall have eternal life. That's the subjective mode in the Greek, if that impresses you. What that means is he ought to have eternal life. Might not get it, but he ought to have it. So God says, I'm just willing to open my arms, let Jesus die for the world, and then say, whosoever wants to come, I'm willing for him to come. But whosoever believeth, believeth, those are the only ones who can come, and right there now, is where the rubber meets the road. What does he mean? Whosoever believeth, believeth. Most people say, well, everybody knows what that means. Everybody is aware of what that means. Again, I'd say, good, tell me then. Explain it to me. Well, it just means trust in him and believe what he's Going, says is going to happen. How do you know that? How do we know that? The word believe is used many, many times through the Bible. It has all kinds of shadings with different meanings. We do the same thing. We may use the same word, English word, three different times in a conversation meaning three different things. How do you know what the meaning is. Context. Context. That's how you always know. Context is always keen. And you have to look at the context to understand what it is. Why do we think the faith that's described in John 3.16 just is the one that's just you just stand here and say, Lord, just zap me with whatever you want me to do. Just because I believe in you, I'm going to pray a sinner's prayer. And as they would say on television, at the end of that prayer, we believe that you've been baptized by the Holy Spirit, and we believe that salvation has come to you. How do you take this one verse and pour all that meaning through a funnel into it and know that much? 
And the answer is you can't. You can't. You've got to look at the context. So let's look at the context for a few minutes as we talk about John 3.16. The word, uh, or the, uh, there's a word that's a very interesting word that I believe is key to this context, and I actually left it out a while ago on, on purpose. Before I talk about that word, I want to give you two quick illustrations to kind of set the table for it. I'm sure you see, I live over in the Dallas area, and so I, I see this a lot, but I bet you do out here too. On weekends, if you see a construction site, if it's a big building being built, a lot of times you'll be driving along from a distance and you'll see a big crane with an arm on it over here and just dangling in the air is a welding rig. You ever notice that? And I've thought to myself sometimes, why, is, why have they got that welding ring just dangling in the air? Is somebody pl playing a joke and, and, and just messing around? Or what? Well, I've been told that's probably because on the weekend especially, they don't want to take the welding rig back to wherever they came from, and they don't want anybody to steal it, and they don't want any vandalism. So they hang it up there. But from a distance, you really can't see that there's a line, a chain, a cable holding it. But there is. That's one illustration. Second illustration, I don't see these commercials as much anymore, but used to, there was commercials on television all the time about super glue. You remember those? Super glue. Glue anything in the world... It was super glue, and you cannot get it apart. I've never had much luck with it, to tell you the truth. Maybe I'm just too dumb to know how to use it. Only thing I'm good at is getting my thumb and my index finger glued together when I get through with it, and I have to kind of sand everything off to get those apart. But on the commercial, they'd take a car, and they'd take a plate on a cable, a flat plate, and they'd say, we're going to put five drops of super glue and put it down on the top of that car, and they lift it up. It's amazing. I can't get it to do anything but stick to my hands, and they, they've got a car, and it's hanging up there. You say, what's that got to do with anything? That bonding agent, that cable, whatever it is that's tying that welding rig to that crane and that car to that plate, that glue, if you please, that cement, that's the word that I'm going to be talking about here in John 3.16. It's the bonding age. It's the first word. Everybody sometimes seems to pass over it. But look, if you have your New Testaments, to John 3.16 now. The first word is for. You see it there? For God so loved the world. world. You see it? For. You leave that word out and you start in the middle of a thought. Really, you start, if you go back and look at it, in the middle of a sentence. Jesus didn't just say, God so loved the world. He could have, but he didn't. He said, for God so loved the world. Well, why is that significant? It's significant because that ties this verse back to what has just been said. It would be very similar to you and I talking along and I say, well now, or in light of that, that would let you know what I'm fixing to say ties to what I've just told you. And it ties it together. It's a connect. It's a bonding agent to what was said before. So suddenly, this passage says, for God so loved the world. For what? For what? To what does it refer? Well, very quickly, because I'm working on the clock here, but very quickly, to answer that question, I'm going to have to tell you a snake story. Everybody likes snake stories. But most of the snake stories that I'm going to tell you about have to do out in Sweetwater, Texas at the rattlesnake roundup they have out there every year. I used to, when I was in school in Abilene, 
I preached at a little town that we weren't but 35 miles from Sweetwater. But I never went to the Rattlesnake Roundup. Didn't want to. Chip said, I'm helping the church in Mangum, Oklahoma now, and I have for a couple of years and didn't realize it until I got up there. They have a rattlesnake roundup bigger than Sweetwater. And I haven't been able to escape this one. It's too big a deal for the town. It's, it's a, use, actually it's outreach because that's where all the, we have 35,000 people come in there for this thing. If you've ever been, what you see is lots of rattlesnakes. They catch them in sacks. They bring them in. They weigh them. They stretch them out. They measure them. They skin them. They sell the skin. They milk them, get the venom out of them for medicine. And then you can walk down here at the end of the block and they'll fry you up a plate if you're so inclined, a fresh rattlesnake, which I have said thank you but no thank you each time. They even have on hand somebody from the Humane Society to make sure that you kill those rattlesnakes right when they've been caught. My question was, how do you kill a rattlesnake wrong? <laughs> I don't know how you would mess that up if you're trying to kill one of them. But that's the snake. Everybody loves snake stories. When I was a little boy, I was in the hospital with measles one time. I got so sick with measles, and they brought a boy younger than me that occupied the bed next to me who had been bitten by a copperhead snake. And I'll never forget how he moaned and groaned and cried. And it's awful. People come out and they talk about, look at my leg. It's swelled up to my knees three times the size of what it usually is. And we talk about all these snake stories. Well, the snake story that Jesus refers to takes place <coughs> in the wilderness. The Israelites had left Egypt. They had escaped bondage. They were on their way to the promised land. They get down by Mount Horan, and as they made their way, the Bible says in Numbers 21, the way is hard, it's bitter, the people are tired. They never expected this. They'd been slaves, and now they thought once the Red Sea opened up, it was just going to be smooth sailing, but it wasn't. It wasn't. And very quickly, they turned to Moses, and they said, the way is hard it's dry, there's no water to drink, no food to eat, we're tired of this manna. And they murmured, they complained, and they griped, and Moses and God, it says both, and God, when he heard this, he sent fiery serpents among them. The serpents bit the people, and they began to die. So the Israelites turned to Moses and said, Moses, do something, intercede for us, go to God, ask him to get rid of these snakes to save us. So God, or Moses went to God. He interceded for the people. And God said, okay, I'll take away the snakes. But here's how we're going to cure the snake bites. He said, you build a fiery serpent. You fashion a fiery serpent. Put it on a pole out there in the middle of the camp. And it shall come to pass, everyone bitten by a serpent who will go and look will live strange kind of cure but God's remedies if you look at them through the Bible have nearly always been strange remember Naaman fellow from Syria had the leprosy he travels all the way uh, 2 Kings chapter 5 tells the story and he gets down there waiting to hear some special instructions of what he can do. The maiden in his house had said, if you'll go back to my homeland of Israel, there's a prophet there can cure you. But instead of the prophet coming out, he sent a servant. The servant came out and said, go down to the Jordan River and dip seven times. Go back and read it when you have time. Naaman said, behold, I thought... That's the problem. I thought. I thought I'd come down here and you, the prophet would come out and he'd wave his hands and say some fancy words and I would be, uh, that would be a curing worthy of the God that you talk about. And now you tell me to go down to this muddy, filthy Jordan River and dip seven times. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. But it worked. 
It worked. Jesus made clay one time during his ministry and told the blind man, he said, I'm going to put this mud clay on your eyes and you go down to the pool of Siloam and, you, and wash and you'll see. Fortunately, the man didn't say, well, that doesn't make any sense to me. How could that work? The Bible says, John 9, 7, he went down and washed in the pool and he went away seeing. It's pretty interesting. You say, why does God do it that way? I don't know. And I don't know anybody that does. But that's the way he seems to like to do things. So let's go back to the serpent on the pole. Look like the problem. But it's the cure. And everybody who was bitten, the Bible says, it came to pass that everybody who went out to look, lived, and was cured. Lived and was cured. You know, I'm sure there were some people who probably said, I don't know why I'd have to go out there and do that. I'm not walking down to the center of the camp. Look at my leg. Look at my knee. Look how swollen up it is. I've been bit by a snake. Why don't they run that pole by my tent door here, and I'll look out the door of my tent, and I'll look at it. I'm not going down there. You know what happened? They died. They died. Everybody who went and looked lived. Everybody who did not go died. Now you say, I thought we was talking about John chapter 3. We are. Don't get lost now. Come back to John chapter 3 if you still got your New Testaments. Let's come back to it. John 3, 14 says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, Folks, we are buying the context right here. You with me? We are buying the context. As Moses, in the manner that Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth may in him have eternal life. Almost sounds like John 3.16. That's John 3.15. Now, we've talked about the uplifted serpent. Now, Jesus said, we're going to talk about the uplifted Christ. One's put up on a pole. The other is put on a cross. John chapter 12, 33 says, He said this, signifying what manner of death he was to die. He was lifted up on the cross. And he says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What does he mean here? What does it mean? He is saying, Jesus is saying, if you somehow take the story of the snake and the bronze serpent, and you take the story of Jesus Christ on the cross, and you lay them down side by side, there is at least this one parallel, maybe more, but at least this one parallel. They both were lifted up. They both were the remedy. They both were the answer. And somebody had to do something in both. Now, I ask the question again. Were the people bitten by the fiery serpent saved by God? Yes. Were they cured by God? Yes. How were they cured? They were cured because they believed strongly enough to get up out of the tent and make their way to the middle of the camp and look at the brass serpent, and they were cured. When you look, you will live. That's what God said. And when that man got up out of his tent door and took steps toward the pole where the serpent was, every step he took was a step of faith. Every one of them. And the ones that didn't have faith, they didn't go. They didn't go because they didn't believe. The ones who didn't believe stayed in the tent 
and they died. And that's the way it worked. Suddenly then, we ask the question, well, what kind of faith is John describing here? It's not the kind of faith where you just sit down and do nothing. That's not what John 3.16 ever meant. Somebody might say, I believe God will heal me right here. If he wants to heal me, he's not limited by poles or he's not limited by a symbol. He's not limited by anything. He can save me right here. But he didn't. That's the point. He didn't. And that's the context of John 3.16. He commanded them what to do, and every step they took was a step of faith. Why suddenly can we come to John 3.16 and say that doesn't apply to us in our faith? I just don't think we can. Some say, I just think all you have to do is just have a simple knowledge, just believe. I think that we are saved by faith. I do too. I do too. If it's the kind of faith Jesus is talking about. Or the kind of faith that Paul talks about. The Apostle Paul we talked about earlier, he writes more of the New Testament than anybody else. And one of his very finest writings is the book of Romans. Romans is the book we run to to talk about being saved by faith, justified by faith. And that is the theme of that book. But may I encourage you to go home and sometime look and realize that the way Paul starts that great letter, Romans chapter 1, verse 5, he says, I'm going to write these things to you to bring about the obedience of your faith. You hear that? Check me out. And then at the very end of the book, Romans 16, verse 26, as he's about to finish it, he says, these things I have written to you are something along that line that he says to bring about the obedience of your faith. Romans is sandwiched between those two phrases, those two uh, statements by the Apostle Paul. The obedience of your faith. Are we saved by faith? I certainly believe we are, yes. But it's the kind of faith that Paul described that he said, I fought the fight. I finished the course. Finished the race. I kept the faith. But it's the kind of faith that a person that believes in Jesus Christ, he confesses it, she confesses it to the world and takes the steps that the New Testament tells us to take. And no place along the way confessing Jesus, being baptized for our sins, any of the, the, the faithful service we give, not one single step, not one single thing is anything but faith. There's no merit in it. It's the obedience of faith that Paul talks about. Paul says we need to have the shield of faith so that we can fight off, we can distinguish all of the fiery arrows coming our way. That's the kind of faith that will sustain us, an obedient faith. Thank you for having me here. It is 8 o'clock straight up. We're going to close with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day, so much for this good church, for everyone who's come out in the middle of the week to to study, to sing, to pray, and to fellowship together. And Father, we pray that you'll bless us and bless this church and all of our efforts. And Father, help us to remain faithful. Help us to be able to say, as Paul did, I kept the faith. Didn't just start, I kept it. Help us in that endeavor, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you.